<laughs> like, is there a particularly weird native plant, like the weirdest native plant that's just a very strange, unique, like, why is that plant like that? I haven't thought about plants in that way. <laughs> the thing that I love about plants is that they keep me on my toes. Oh. Like, I think that I know a species, and then I'll go hiking and be like, <laughs> what are you doing here? Like, this isn't where you grow. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hey, Thank hi. you so much for joining us. Thank you for um, the invite. <laughs> <laughs> to get started, can you I mean, introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us about uh, you, your history here with Watershed, how you got yeah. involved with natives. I was a marine biologist studying toxicology, and then I did a summer job with the state parks as an interpreter down in Santa Cruz County. And the local resource manager there did a restoration project on the sand dunes where he removed about a hundred meters of a non-native beach grass. And um, he planted some native species there, but also all these native plants that had been just like waiting in the seed bank for 50 plus years came up. And the amazing thing is when you were walking along the sand dunes in the area of the European beach grass, it was like the sound of the waves and wind. And then you walked into the stretch that they had restored and it was buzzing. There was insects, there was birds, it was just alive. And the contrast, I just, I was like, plants are amazing. <laughs> I fell in love with plants. I uh, moved back to the Bay Area and met my business partner. One night, she had a dream that she lost her job during the vegetation monitoring. And in her dream, she dreamt that she started um, a nursery. So she came up to me and another friend was like, I had this dream, either of you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> Um, so we started the nursery back in 2001 and we started only growing, uh, for contracts for local restoration projects. And then as interest in native plants has grown, we open one day a week for retail. And then we moved here to this, um, land that we leased from the city of Richmond in Point Richmond, uh, in 2008 and opened retail six days a week. Amazing. That's awesome. That's it's, such a good story. It's a good story. I love it. It's a good dream. It's also a good dream. I know, yeah. right? It was like literally a dream. Yeah. 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 I'm glad it wasn't just like a falling dream. You're like, well, I can't help you with that. Right. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. We can open a nursery if you want. Yeah. So before we kind of move on, I was hoping you could help define for us, like, what is the definition of native? How oh, do you determine what's a native and what's question. not a native? Such a good question. Function wise, it's a function of coevolution time. So the, the flora and fauna that have evolved together over enough time to have their life cycles be dependent on each other. For us here in California, we really have a luxury because it started being invaded <laughs> relatively recently. I mean, a lot of early explorers were recording flora and fauna, um, where some places in Europe, people have been there for so long and being so impactful for so long that it's hard to know exactly what the native flora was anywhere. Mm. But in California, we have more records and a more recent history. So we actually have pretty good documents of what is native in this, in California, pre-major European settlement. Why natives? Why would someone want to plant natives? Why do we want to support natives? Why use natives? It's sort of like everybody I know who started using them, you just see the answer because they come, right? Yeah. You plant them and they come. And when we started the nursery here, it was just an empty lot. And we would have our little tray of D16s of this Aristolochia plant. And I don't know how these butterflies get this signal, right? I've got like, I mean, less than <laughs> like a bundle like that of plant material. And somehow they're getting the signal of it and coming and they're just down zeroing and in. planting, yeah. planting it was, laying eggs on there. I, I guess it was after uh, the rise of internet. So I guess they used the yeah, Craigslist <laughs> or the social, <laughs> social right. media. They were all connected. It was like the Tinder for the... Exactly. For the, yeah. <laughs> there's just a lot of good stuff right <laughs> there. They just swipe left on all that good, all that milkweed. That's right. There's this fellow named Doug Tallamy. 
and he's he's based on the East Coast, but he's been doing a lot of research in his area on native and non-native. He's been focusing on trees and he's been focusing on caterpillars. Um, but the data that he's had is just um, like sort of astounding in regards to both the number of caterpillars and the diversity of caterpillars that are found on native trees versus non-native trees. And then you have a whole cascade of, well, caterpillars means birds, right? So the birds are coming to eat the caterpillars. So you have this whole diversity and abundance of birds that are coming along because you have this diversity of mm -hmm. caterpillars. The history of the coevolution means that the habitat value of what you're putting in your garden is higher than sure. it would be when you're using something that's from a different country where those organisms haven't co-evolved. Together. Well, and, and it's funny because we started um, last year, we started on the process of building a bee box. We were trying mm -hmm. to do like a bee house. That was like, it's a very trendy thing. It's like all over the internet. <laughs> and we read some books on it and we were like, okay, we got a book from Germany. And I was like, this is great. And then as we were doing some research, we were like, well, wait, but California native bees aren't the same as European bees. Right. Yep. And a lot of California bees we found out are like ground, like they, they burrow into ground or they burrow into holes. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of ran into that issue of like, oh, right. I guess you can't, it's not like a one size fits all. It's like you might have very specific species in your area that like, that like a very specific plant or a very specific environment. This one study, I think it was from Xerces Society, that they were looking at honeybees in a sunflower field. And I guess that honeybees can be kind of methodical. Mm. So they'll come and they'll do, 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 go from flower to flower to flower, but they're not moving pollen between the flowers. Yeah. So they're not as effectively pollinating. And then the native bees are a little bigger and more random and they come and like disturb the honeybees. And so actually having native bees present increased the pollination rate because they were disturbing the pattern of the honeybees to be more random mm. and do more cross pollination. Interesting. That's amazing. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, I had no idea yeah. that that was So it's like honeybees, you need them, but then you bring native bees in also and you actually increase your... Can you give us uh, an example of interaction between the the, uh, the native life and the native plants that you talked about? The flora about? and the fauna. Yeah, yeah the pipe vine, um, Aristolochia californica that we have growing over by our office. And it is the the sole host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail with this, this amazing like black and blue iridescent butterfly that's a native butterfly. And that's the only plant that it will lay its eggs on. And then when the eggs hatch, the caterpillars come out and they devastate the vine. It's amazing, actually. That we can't really figure out if there's any benefit to the vine at all. Um, but they'll just munch it down and then they go and do their pupating and become beautiful butterflies. And the vine is just like, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy to be a part of this process. <laughs> and then does it, does it re, does the vine re-sprout? It does. does it reseed itself? It comes up the next year. Yeah, it gets eaten down and then it sprouts back up from the same root system. If in the vegetable garden, uh, if we have a problem, for example, with that specific uh, butterfly, with the caterpillar that would eat the plants, so then all we ha would have to do here in California is plant uh, that vine, and it's gonna just they not they wouldn't attack the vegetable garden. They would use those ones instead. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that would be a good plant for uh, for uh, that pest, let's say. Yeah. Uh, what kind of record? repercussions mm -hmm. that's the word okay mm -hmm. uh, repercussions when a non-native species takes the place of a native species uh -huh. so you can have all sorts of different kinds depending on your habitat um so the the loss in diversity is a huge one so that one plant in the resources it can provide compared to 25 different species in the amount of resources they provide for different types of fauna is a major one. Um, of course, you can have things with non-native species like eucalyptus and enhancing fire. You can have issues like on the Colorado River with tamarisk where it's completely changed the water table. And so because the tamarisk yeah. is sucking up the water faster, the native trees and shrubs in the area are dying and they happen to be the habitat for some endangered wow. bird species. Um, we had a non-native um, cord grass brought into the San Francisco Bay Area and it um, hybridized with the native and it spread into the mudflats, which are 
very important feeding grounds for migrating birds because there's all sorts of invertebrates living in those it's like a buffet in there. Yeah. So it was filling that in. And then it was also into the pickleweed marsh, which is the habitat for the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse. And it had changed the habitat for the endangered ridgeway rails, fire resources, water. They're called sometimes sort of environmental engineers because they're actually not just changing the biotic component of the resources, but the abiotic components as well. In permaculture, they suggest people, no matter where in the world, to use native plants as much as possible. Uh, first, uh, most of them are perennials, so less care. But in general, mm -hmm. perennials or in annuals, native plants, they have that symbiosis with, this in the, with their environment that they require almost zero care. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's fantastic. Can you tell us about how native plants and the drought they work together. The cool thing about California is it's so topographically diverse that we have this huge, I mean, we have over half of the diversity of all the flora of North America in California. It's cool. Anyway, and many of them need plenty of water, <laughs> but many of them are also adapted to dealing with drought. Um, I still, we still recommend for people to water when things are planted until they get well established. Um, but yeah, once they're well established, they can survive. You know, if they're in someone's garden and they're getting a little more water, they're going to stay green longer. But um, they will survive. And as soon as you get the first rain, if we get rain, <laughs> yeah. they will sprout, start growing again mm. and come back up. And they will, like if you see native bunch grasses, even with drought and you see them in July or August, compared to the annuals, which are the golden, right? Our golden rolling hills of California are non-native European grasses. So the native grasses are perennial bunch grasses that actually retain green longer throughout the year so they wouldn't have that lovely golden color. So we have a lot of summer dormant plants here. Yeah. In fact, one of our fellows who's from El Salvador was watering his first summer here. And he was come up to me and he's like, I'm watering this plant, I'm watering this plant, I don't know what's wrong with it. And I was like, oh, oh I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. It's a buckeye. And buckeyes drop their leaves, they go summer dormant. So they had dropped it. I was like, no, no, it's fine. It's doing just what it's supposed to do right now. I noticed some shapes and I'm very curious what the yeah, shapes Yeah, well, were. so this Doug Tallamy image I really love. So he's sort of like, you know, this is how we used to choose plants. So you might be screening, you know, these are landscaping terms, focal point anchor and the decorative. And it's really about like us mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. What do we want in our garden kind of thing? Um, and now we're shifting to more balance. So all of that's still there, but bringing in all this, you know, supporting food webs, protecting watersheds. Moderating weather, supporting natural enemies, creating pollinator habit, restoring soil, storing carbon, wildlife appreciation. Um, oh, so a more balanced. What one can do in his own scale to help? Yeah. So uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, you know, with a limited square footage, like they've said, they've got this data accumulated of having a diversity of native plants. Um, can provide valuable habitat for, you know, birds and bees and butterflies in your garden, plus all the critters that come with them. And um, in a neighborhood, like what, so one thing they've found is like, if you clump species in your planting, so you have more than one of a species that is a good nectar or um, pollen resource for a pollinator, they, do, they it's more efficient for them because they yeah. can eat a whole bunch right there mm. instead of if you have them sort of scattered like one here, one here, and one there. They yeah. eat here and then they got to fly over there. Ah, it's like having like a little mall, like a food court for yeah. your, for your, you, want, like, you don't wanna you want to have to go to right a different, there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to go to one food court and then have to cross the other end of the mall yes. and go somewhere else to eat. Yeah, okay. And then also these ideas of, um, like creating corridors within the neighborhood. So neighborhoods are coordinating with each other with palettes of, of um, sort of echoing a similar palette targeting. A lot of people are focusing on monarchs, um, but it's monarchs, whatever the plants that are benefiting monarchs benefit this whole cascading 
realm, yeah. um, so that they can provide, you know, corridors for the pollinators to be able to move through hmm. their neighborhood, their city, their county. It's really that's interesting. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. people are like. Um, are like working together, like neighborhoods are getting together and they're, they're getting everyone on board with, with each it. other. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love hearing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say it's like I'm someone that I have no idea where to start, but where uh, can I search for that? Uh, what kind of plants starting with? Yeah, we are really lucky in California. We have some amazing resources that a lot of other places don't have. Like the Jepson Manual is a manual of the native flora of California. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what this thing is, you go through this dichotomous key, you can figure it out. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> not always. But um, And then we have like Cal Flora is amazing. Um, and Calscape is a really great one. So Cal Flora is more of like you want to explore the flora in your area, what grows here. But um, Calscape you can go into and say, uh, I'm one of... I'm curious about yarrow and it'll show you like all the different butterflies and bees that, and birds that use yarrow. You can put in there like I have, I want it to be drought tolerant. I want it to flower at this time of year. Um, so we have a lot of resources. Mm. I don't think that's true for everybody. <laughs> so we can say like if you were somewhere else than the uh, United States, just like look for your local look for a local nursery a native nursery and if you don't find one that doesn't exist so you have a great opportunity to create one there you go yeah yeah <laughs> have a friend <laughs> have a dream <laughs> and then call yeah. you okay, yeah. and start the dream yeah. the first native <laughs> nursery <laughs> in pittsburgh <laughs> I guess um, technically we're kind of an invasive species. One of Human, the best. <laughs> humans with suburban tract homes it's, are yeah. pretty pretty invasive. We're, we're really we're really good at it. <laughs> <laughs>